Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. My name is Lyle Seligson, and I'm a freshman at the college, and I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on both the park side and the JFK street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation tonight online by tweeting with the hashtag BiodiversityForum, which is also listed in your program. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming our guests, Edward O. Wilson, Jonathan Drivis, and tonight's moderator, Linda Bomas. Okay. So, welcome. Uh, it's lovely to see you. I'm Linda Bilmas, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the John F. Kennedy Forum. This evening, we have a special treat with two extraordinary panelists. Let me first introduce Harvard University Professor Emeritus Edward O. Wilson, known as the father of biodiversity. And it's difficult to even begin to do justice to Ed's career, but among other things, Ed is the author of 34 books. He's written two Pulitzer Prizes. He has 17 pages on his CV of additional prizes, including the National Medal of Science. He is the world's foremost authority on ants, and he is the leader of the global half-Earth movement, which I will ask him to explain to you tonight. Let me also welcome another biologist, Jonathan Jarvis, who for the past eight years has worked as the director of the U.S. National Park Service. John joined the Park Service as a young man, as a ranger, and has worked as the superintendent of many iconic places in the United States, including Mount Rainier Park, uh, Craters of the Moon National Monument, and uh, Wrangell St. Elias Park in, in Alaska. So, I am going to ask John and Ed. Um, John has just written a book on the future of conservation in America, in which he explains conservation and lays out an action plan. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask them to just start by explaining a few terms that are commonly in use. So John, maybe I can ask you first to explain what do we mean by conservation? Okay, um, well, thanks everybody for coming out tonight and thank you Linda and Ed for joining us here on the stage uh, as well. I'm sorry Terry uh, could not make it. Um, she had an accident uh, earlier this week and couldn't make it with us. But So um, conservation to me um, is in part the role that humans play in stewardship, in our relationship uh, with other beings on the planet. Um, it's, it's more than preservation. Um, it requires us to apply the best available sound science, uh, to understand the, the legal framework, the fidelity uh, to the law, and that we think and act in the long term, in the long term public interest, as we steward these other beings and other things on this planet that basically allow us to live here. Um, it's, a, it's an evolving uh, responsibility, um, and it rests on the shoulders of everybody uh, on the planet. And so, maybe I can ask you Ed, to explain to us a few other terms, starting with what do we mean by biodiversity, a term that you invented, and maybe you can also tell us what do we mean by climate change, what do we mean by the environment, what do we mean by ecosystem? Well, I'm going to... the hard question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm going to seize this moment uh, to do a little bit of... of uh, uh, description and, and, uh, and, and definition. So I'll take a little longer than the director here. <laughs> uh, but this is to kind of give us a, a substance. 
to what we're going to be talking about. This is, uh, I've been at Harvard, incidentally, for 66 years with an appointment. I came as a uh, graduate <laughs> teaching uh, fellow and uh, ended up uh, as a university professor. And I now, well, that is as an academic, straight academic, and now I'm uh, honorary curator of uh, entomology at the Museum of Comparative Zoology. So I'm trying to break the record. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, uh, so uh, what is biodiversity? Biodiversity is the commonality of all heritable variation. That's inherited, gene-based variation uh, at all levels of uh, life. And there are three basic levels in a hierarchy of life and genetic variation. Ecosystems such as ponds, coral reefs, forest patches, then the species that compose the ecosystems, and finally, the genes at the base that prescribe the traits that define the genes that compose the ecosystems. How many species are there on Earth? At the present time, slightly more than two million species of all kinds of organisms have been described. And the estimated number, we get this by refraction techniques on rates of discovery, is 10 million, roughly 10 million, give it, take a million. This means that there remains on this planet approximately 80% of the species still to be discovered. And these I'm speaking of are eukaryotic species, that is, above the level of bacteria and other microorganisms uh, in complexity. Um, and so this itself is a great challenge in the overall effort to conserve all of biodiversity on, in, in the world. How fast are those species going extinct? Approximately somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times faster than before the coming of humans. Probably a little closer to 100, 100 than 1,000, but accelerating. For example, in the last 100 years, uh, fish species and major races of freshwater fish uh, in the United States uh, went, were extinguished at a rate about 900 times the rate before humans came. The rate of extinction before humans spread around the world generally averages out to about one species going extinct per million species per somewhere between uh, a million and 10 million years. And we've upped it up substantially, orders of magnitude, and we are accelerating it. What causes uh, the uh, extinction? Keep in mind the acronym HIPPO. The causes of, of extinction at the hands of humanity uh, is uh, easily remembered by the acronym HIPPO. With uh, the letters in order, uh, give uh, the corresponding to the importance of that uh, mode or uh, cause of extinction. H for habitat destruction, and that includes due to climate change. I is for introduced species, which cost us, incidentally, uh, in this country over $250 billion a year, those <coughs> introduced, and they are deadly to so many of our native species. First P for pollution, the second P just general for side effects of human population increase, and O in hippo is, means, is, is for over-harvesting, over-fishing, over-hunting, the yeah, hunting out of species. How f uh, well are the conservation organizations in the world doing in slowing the rate of species extinction? Not very well. In the case of land vertebrates, that's mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, um, the um, rate 
uh, is such that one-fifth of all of the species of the land-based vertebrates are on the red list of endangered species, somewhere from vulnerable to uh, highly critical, critically endangered. And um, one-fifth, and how well have we done with that one, what have we achieved with that one-fifth worldwide? Um, in the case of uh, those species, we have slowed the descent down that red list from vulnerable, vulnerable to highly endangered and extinct. We've slowed down only one-fifth of the species that are now on that list in their descent toward extinction. So we've done a very poorly job, a very poor job. And that, ma'am, is concludes my first lesson that I've given at Harvard in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come um, back to uh, some of the meaning of that later. Well, when we think about biodiversity, let's watch a clip uh, from uh, Ed's foundation, which shows us some of the large mammals, but certainly captures some of the majesty around the world. Threats to the natural world are multiplying. Species are going extinct at an alarming rate. Unless we move quickly to protect global biodiversity, we will soon lose most of the species composing life on Earth. But there's a solution. It's called Half Earth. If we can serve half the land and sea, we can still safeguard the bulk of our planet's biodiversity. But what would half Earth look like? How do we get there? By mapping our planet's biodiversity in fine detail, and in relation to human activities, we can pinpoint the best places to conserve the maximum number of species. Mindful of our ever-changing world, we can identify wildlife corridors and other management solutions that can help sustain biodiversity. With the right information to guide effective conservation efforts, we have the opportunity to support the most biodiverse places in the world, as well as the people who call these paradises home. The Half Earth Project is working to engage people everywhere in why these places are special and how they can best be managed to protect life on Earth. Through cutting edge technology, we're mapping the magnificent global web of biodiversity with unprecedented resolution and providing scientific leadership and actionable guidance for conservation to achieve the goal of Half Earth. We can share this precious planet of ours. All life can prosper. It would be humanity's greatest achievement. Can we really save half the Earth? Yes, we can if we want to. Thank you. So now I'm going to ask you the questions that I think is on everyone's mind, which is, Ed, so you were a kid in Alabama. How did you get interested in ants? Couldn't make the football team. <laughs> 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 no. I, uh, I was an only child. We traveled around a lot in Alabama. Uh, I went because my father was constantly changing localities partly because he had a traveling job with one of the old alphabet uh, agencies of the Roosevelt era. Uh, I uh, went to uh, 16 
different schools in 11 grades, and it was pretty solitary as an only child. And I just took to nature as a uh, source of adventure, of satisfaction, of special studies that I really enjoyed doing myself. I had the, uh, the Boy Scout of America. Hail to the Boy Scouts of America as my source of major education and became self-educated in many areas uh, and just decided that that's what I wanted to do. I had no chance whatsoever of becoming director of the National Park System. I wasn't certain that I would be uh, even qualified to uh, be a, a, a ranger, but I was sort of hoping that that's what I would do would be, would be a ranger in a park, a major park, or that I could get a job eventually as uh, in uh, hel helping farmers uh, identify their insects and other pests, and uh, that that would be, a, that would keep me outdoors, and that's what I wanted more than anything else in the world. So things just opened up for me. I was very fortunate, and I wish everyone sitting here not only to develop the same innate gut feeling for conservation, but that they will have an adventure uh, in nature comparable to the one that I've benefited with. Well, I'm gonna to turn to John in a minute, but, you, but, but why ants? Why ants? What was it about ants? Well, uh, I uh, started with butterflies. Okay. Uh, and then I went to snakes for my passion. And there are 32 species of snakes in the South Central Gulf area where I spent a lot of my boyhood. And I collected and found and collected almost all of them. Then, tiring of snakes, I began to look around for some other insect in which I might become a world authority, enough to get me into college anyway. And so I hit upon uh, ants because I had uh, seen so many interesting kinds and begun to study them and keep them and so on. And then went to the University of Alabama as the first member of my family to go to college, uh, having learned a great deal now on my own, which I figured would be enough to get me through the freshman year of my uh, uh, of my uh, a student career at, uh, at the University of Alabama, and I found that lo and behold, I had more than enough to get through my uh, freshman year. And I just stayed with entomology and with a wonderful faculty there that uh, gave me the kind of personal attention as a student, as they did to any other student who seemed to flourish by it. And thus I stayed with what I began. So, John, you also studied biology, and then you joined the National Park, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you managed, how you, why did you join the National Parks, and how did you rise from the many thousands of park rangers to be the superintendent of key parks, to be a regional director, and to be appointed by President Obama as the director of the National Parks? Um, I guess just lucky, I guess. Um, the, uh, much like Ed, um, I grew up you know, in the outdoors uh, and found uh, my favorite places in, in, in the forests of Virginia. I grew up in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia and um, knew very early on that I wanted to pursue uh, college in the sciences and then a career in the outdoors. It had to be outside. Uh, um, and uh, I knew a little bit about the federal side, the U.S. Forest Service backed up to my uh, place that I lived, and so I knew what a ranger was, sort of, and, um, and sort of fell into the Park Service uh, through uh, my brother, who was working for NPCA, the National Parks Conservation Association, who suggested that I consider the Park Service as a career. I started in 1976 as a seasonal, uh, on the National Mall uh, in Washington, D.C., and um, went west pretty quickly uh, to uh, 
Uh, first stop was Guadalupe Mountains National Park in Texas. And I think that my career path has always been one where I was willing to sort of take on the tough issues. I, if Whenever there was a complicated, difficult issue uh, that required a little bit of science and, and a lot of policy and some legal aspects and, and probably, uh, you know, a few battle scars along the way, I was always the one that stuck up my hand and said I would, I would take that on. Um, and uh, approach it from uh, a strategic intent, from a, a solution-based, community-focused, and a, and a resolution that, that improved the environment. And I guess over time, I, they kept giving me harder and harder issues until they gave me the directorship uh, in, um, in 2009 with President Obama. And what is the role, maybe you can describe to us the breadth of the national parks? and the national park system, and what is the role of the national parks before we get back to the biodiversity issue, but how does the national parks help protect biodiversity, and what is the role of the national parks in conservation? Sure, so um, the United States can sort of claim that you know, we created the idea behind national parks. So Wallace Stegner called it America's best idea, uh, in that we would set aside a piece of land for the people. Uh, for the primary purpose of protecting it unimpaired for future generations. Abraham Lincoln did it first with the Mariposa Grove of the giant sequoias at what is now Yosemite, literally during the Civil War. Uh, and 1872, Yellowstone followed that. Today, there are 417 uh, park units across the nation in all states. And they range from the largest, to Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Reserve, which I was the superintendent, 13 million acres, same size as Switzerland, um, down to very, very small units that represent the cultural and historical history of the nation. And the intent behind it is to be representative, um, that of the ecosystems uh, that are found within the United States and the cultural history of our nation as well. And there are clearly gaps in both of those inventories, one that we have sought to, uh, to fill. On the biodiversity ecological side of the scale, the national parks uh, are sort of the anchor stores uh, in a larger landscape. They are locations of perhaps the least amount of stress. All systems are under stress from uh, human populations and climate change, but perhaps the, the fewest amount of stressors are found within national parks. So they serve, uh, one, as an opportunity for good science, monitoring uh, of what is going on. Uh, they are reservoirs of, of biological diversity, but they also uh, are, they're, only, they're, they're islands, uh, and we have to remember that they're, they're not big enough. Um, I mentioned Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Reserve, 13 million acres, anadromous fish, salmon migrate in and out, caribou migrate in and out, migratory birds. So that was a big lesson for me that uh, in this case is that these, these boundaries are porous and we need a much larger landscape approach to conservation than even setting aside very, very large areas uh, for protection. And, and when we think about the importance of public land and protecting land, I mean, we've talked a little bit about the scientific importance, and we talked a little bit about the, 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 the issues um, around protecting them and how much space is protected. I just wanted to bring in the voice of Terry Tempest Williams for a minute, uh, who has written a, a beautiful introduction to your book. Um, Terry, had, has, uh, who, who, who fell in Harvard Square, has sent me a text saying, please give the audience my conviction that our public lands are breathing spaces, reservoirs for our spirits, where our collective history in both shadow and light resides in the name of communities, both human and wild. And so I want you to both comment on the spiritual dimension of the land and the biodiversity of the species. And then I'm gonna go back and we'll talk about the, the um, solutions in the half earth. But I wonder if we could talk <clears throat> for a minute about the spiritual dimension of human beings communicating 
with the land, the, the, the rest of the ecosystem? How do we fit in? You want me to try that? Yeah, yeah. I think he has more experience at thinking about well, that. He, we, we'll, we'll come back okay. to Terry in a minute, but how, how do we fit <clears throat> into this? All right. How do so, we fit in, Ed? Okay. Look, uh, what makes us human? What makes us human is that emotional apparatus that drives all of our behavior, seeking as we do rational means of achieving our innate goals every minute of our lives. And where did that come from? It came from the evolution of emotional centers and the massive cerebral memory capacity that we acquired in enabling those actions that were emotionally guided. And where did those come from? They came from a million years of what we call hunter-gatherer life. And our ancestors, the ones that created humanity, and the history you should keep in mind did not begin with the origin of literacy 6,000 years ago. It did not begin uh, with the origin of the Neolithic. It began a million years ago uh, with an existence that depended upon intimate relation to the natural world, uh, an appreciation of all of the natural world's qualities, a love of the home, that one forms in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the natural world. So it's inevitable that d deeply in our thinking, we should turn to great satisfaction and uh, imaginative power uh, in that world that gave us birth. Okay. It's pretty hard to top that, but I think <laughs> that uh, if you would like to, if John, if you shot. could read, if you could give it a shot. I'll give it a shot. Um, I think Ed also points out, and I often tell my wife, that we only recently came inside. Um, that as a species, we've been outside for millions of years, and there is a, there is a deep spiritual connection uh, to that. And in my experience in the national parks, that I could take any individual, uh, regardless of their socioeconomic, ethnic background, to uh, you know, the, the rim of the Grand Canyon, uh, or into the high Sierras to see the Milky Way, uh, or to stand beneath the giant sequoias, and they, they are moved. There's something that, that happens uh, to those individuals in those spaces. Um, you know, to honor Terry, who uh, was so gracious to write the introduction to the book that that Gary Macklis and I have uh, have written. I want to read a little section uh, from Terry's introduction. Introduction, and you know, Terry has that extraordinary skill of of writing eloquently about uh, our public lands and our parks. And she's she has a deep deep spiritual side as well. And she often draws from her experiences with the Native Americans of of our nation uh, who often uh, practice that spiritual connection. And in one conversation with the Utah Dene Bikay, uh, a guy that I actually know, Willie Gray Eyes, he said that this is not a time for anger, it is a time for healing. Our public lands and waters, deserts, forests, prairies, our national parks and monuments, wildlife refuges, and free-flowing rivers, lakes, wetlands, and oceans are our common ground, our natural inheritance to be passed on from one generation to the next. They are our sole geographies, the landscapes of our imaginations, the seedbed of an ecological state of mind. We are not only inspired but healed by nature's sense of integrity, harmony, and wholeness. Each time I stand at the Needles overlooking Canyonlands National Park, in the midst of this vast erosional landscape, carved and created through wind and water and time, deep time, I have the sensation of being very, very small, 
and yet very, very large at once. The Navajo have a word for this kind of balance and beauty, hozo. We are one with the universe. Without a spiritual dimension to our work as conservationists, we are only working for ourselves, not the future, and certainly not for future generations of all species. I wonder, Ed, if you could talk to us about the species now. You have described in a recent New York Times op-ed that, the, that, that um, conservation is the story of many victories in a losing war, and that we can potentially reverse climate change, but we can't reverse losing the species in the ecosystems. Could you speak to that? Yes. Uh, the, um, I think that in time, <clears throat> The situation is going to get serious enough. In time, we're going to find out enough about the rest of life, and I just reminded you that we don't even know what 80%, estimated 80% of the species, mostly the little things that run the earth, I like to tell you, uh, we don't know them. And the more we learn about what nature consists of and how it runs, and incidentally, those of who are in science perhaps in biology, evolutionary biology, or environmental biology here seated, should bear in mind that the next big thing in the biological sciences is not going to be AI. We're already beginning that so that the big ideas are there. It's going to be in ecosystem studies. But I'll pass by that quickly. Uh, but uh, the... Uh, more that we become familiar with what the details are, uh, then the more urgent the problem will be. And I predict that within a fairly short period of time, particularly with irreversibility added to the mix of problems that destruction of, the bio, of biodiversity adds to the whole picture, uh, is going to become, uh, will be seen of equal importance uh, demanding the same kind of care and attention as do, does um, uh, climate change at the present time. Uh, but uh, let me go on then quickly. And may I tell you how to solve the problem? The, that, would be, that would be helpful. Okay. <laughs> uh, here's how to do it. And I'll be, um, I'll sound a little firmer than maybe I should uh, about expressing it. But we're short on, you know, we don't have that much time. What needs to be done are three things, three tracks that we take with reference to this, in this whole area of biology opening up. They're partly overlapping. First comes uh, mapping, discovering the rest of biodiversity. And we desperately need to finish the Linnaean enterprise begun in 1735 of finding every species of organism on Earth and diagnosing it, finding out what its traits are, giving it a name, and beginning a study on it. Uh, we are woefully short right now worldwide in people who can do this uh, and in efforts to even begin to achieve it. I might add, for the benefit, I hope there'll be someone writing for the Gazette and the Crimson here present, to make note that Harvard is the logical world center for biodiversity studies. And it hasn't become aware of that yet. <laughs> we have, no, it hasn't. I'm calling it to your attention now. Uh, <clears throat> it has, Harvard has, in the three associated institutions, the Museum of Comparative Zoology with its immense collections of animals. The Arnold Arboretum with its immense world collection of living plants, bushes, arborescent, arborescent flora. And the botanical uh, museums and collections, uh, which include both fungi and flowering plants. It has the largest private collection of organisms in the world. That's Harvard, has it. It's sitting there. It has, in terms of what is needed, virtually 
nobody working on the curatorial research that needs to be done. In the Museum of Comparative Zoology, I only know of something like five or six professors who do anything with the collections of animals that we have sitting there. And recently I helped Harvard, I found some money to move around to endow two and soon we'll have three or may, and maybe four postdoctoral uh, fellowships, four years renewable, to come to Harvard to work on those collections. And we're going to have to have large numbers of experts on groups of organisms, finding the species, classifying them, and beginning to do the specific natural history of each one of those 10 million of species as just a major advance in, in um, human, humanity's scientific knowledge. That's coming. And Harvard, I will just say, uh, is passing, hoping, I, I mean to write an article on this before long and point it out <coughs> uh, urgently, should now become the center for this type of advance. And it's going to mean a lot of support, when it catches on, support and employment of, uh, of young scientists and people with allied, in the allied disciplines of policy, government, and the like. So that is track number one. Track number two is as we f do what should have been finished in the 19th century, certainly in the 20th century, of completing the catalog, the Linnaean catalog, of what species, uh, and we estimate 10 million species, are there still in the, on Earth. Uh, we need to find out everything we possibly can about individual species, and then proceed with at these everywhere around the world. At these all taxa, uh, diversity, uh, biodiversity inventories. The one uh, at me that we have had uh, that um, our director would know well has been done at the Great Smokies Mountain National Park. Mm -hmm. It's a brilliant achievement of finding out now the majority of eukaryotic species uh, in one place, a national park. And incidentally, um, they now, I just checked, they now have the figure, uh, the number of species known from the Great Smoky Mountain National Park of eukaryotic organisms is now at 19,000. Uh -huh. And it's likely to go where the uh, director there tells me another 5,000. You can do this with rarefaction techniques. Uh, many of them still, up to this time unknown to science. So we need ATP after ATP as where our uh, progress in finding out what the total biodiversity of, of this planet actually is. Uh, and we should be finding out in different critical places exactly what species are there, how many there are, what degree of, um, of endangerment they might be in, and that includes invertebrate animals, the small things, in addition to the vertebrates as well. And the final step is then to map the location as soon as we can through ATPs and, and the intensive studies in certain groups that we already have, map the one and choose the one half of the Earth surface in land and in sea to put aside a reserve and if this sounds like a crackpot idea to you, let me assure you uh, that when I published this book, Half Earth, I expected to be uh, face terrible ridicule and maybe a uh, you know resistance. But in fact, uh, it's been received with acclamation by the global conservation community, and got acclamation when I gave it in a talk to environmental leaders at the United Nations during their last meeting because people want a moonshot. And this is a moonshot of conservation that we can achieve. And we need to have these advanced scientific enterprises, 
purposes that I just mentioned, the first two, in order to wisely choose that portion of the earth, half of the earth and half the sea, to set aside. And we can do it, and we can begin doing it now. So Linda, can I pick up on Ed's um, challenge uh, to the planet? Um, so, um, and I couldn't agree more uh, than what Ed has put on the table. What I would add to it, uh, on his first point, that is Harvard doesn't do it, we'll do it at Berkeley, by the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Berkeley, Berkeley's number two. <laughs> I've actually had a meeting with faculty members there <laughs> on that, that kind of program, which they are also planning. Well, I've okay. got my new Institute for Parks, People, and Biodiversity okay. at Berkeley, so we're, we're already launching. Um, the, um, <laughs> the, the second aspect is, okay, so we have this goal to, to preserve half the planet. So how do we do that? Um, so the politics, the public support, uh, the funding, uh, the, all of that has to be aggregated in some way to be successful uh, in this. Um, for the World Conservation Congress, we did an analysis of North America uh, of what is currently protected uh, against the, the IEGE 2020 goals, which are 17% terrestrial and 10% marine. And the United States is at about 12%. Uh, right now in terms of what we have protected in some legal framework. That doesn't mean that they're, they're connected or they're ecologically sustainable. It just means that they're under some sort of protected status. So we have, we have quite a bit to go if we're going to get to 50%. The, the, what, what Dr. Macklis and I try to do in our book is to lay out essentially the strategic intent to get to that, that long-term sort of sustainable, ecologically livable planet. And there is a whole series of actions that Gary and I have tested in our tenures, uh, in our careers, about what works and what sort of doesn't work. Um, and I, I think part of it is bringing the public to understand uh, conservation within their own sort of sphere of influence, what, what matters to them. And there's all kinds of ways to do that. Uh, one is public health. Um, everybody wants to be healthy. Uh, we are literally uh, working now with doctors that are prescribing the outdoors as a part of their general practice. Um, and, but if you don't have outdoors nearby, you know, where do you go if you're being prescribed to go to the outside? So that's a driver for creation of parks within the urban landscape. And those areas within urban, urban landscapes can be connected across a broader landscape to contribute to biodiversity as migratory corridors and stopovers and, and places for climate refugees uh, to, to persist. Um, but we have, and we now have the analytical tools, as, as Ed indicates, to be able to map and then design uh, this, this future so that there are large protected areas, there are integrated spaces within uh, uh, environments where people are still carrying out their lives, um, either subsistence or even urban areas. But across the landscape, they are connected into a, a set of values that provide multiple benefits, whether it's climate adaptation, storm surge, biodiversity, public health, recreation, um, a whole range of values. And if we can build those value sets across different sectors, then you can build the public support to achieve this long-term goal. Let me interject with a couple of devil's advocate questions. So you laid out a sweeping moonshot vision and some kind of pathway to get there. Why, why is it, in, in theory, this would be everybody's priority, but in reality, I think the whole issue of conservation, environmental movement, biodiversity, is often becomes a kind of middle-class person's hobby, even, in, even a rich man's pursuit. Why is that and what can be done about it, even though many of those most affected in the world are not wealthy, in fact, poor? I'd rather pass that on. To my <laughs> okay, right. all right. No, I mean seriously, because yeah. uh, that's very close to his expertise, I think. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've worked in that space for a long time, and certainly the perception that conservation is the hobby of the middle and upper class, the, the visitation to our national parks, 
uh, represents that sort of economic sector in a very large way. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that parks and conservation can't be important to uh, all Americans. Um, and, and we know that it is uh, because when we, we introduce the opportunity to experience these places, as I indicated, uh, it resonates. Now, what has happened uh, over time is that um, barriers have been created to experience uh, places um, like this. And there are, just as there are food deserts within urban spaces, there are park deserts. Uh, there, are, there are communities that just have no green space or whatever space they have has been mistreated or polluted uh, or flooded. Um, and, and so, um, and what happens, and this is a problem that I hope the urban planning crowd is in here that uh, is working on is that when we gentrify uh, these spaces, we often displace at the same time. Um, and we force out lower income communities uh, away from uh, where they have been for perhaps generations. But why we, when we restore that area to some of its natural processes, build a park, restore a river, uh, we actually kick up real estate values and, and displace communities. So there, that, that adds to this perception that um, conservation is only for the wealthy uh, or for the elite. Um, the, the concept of, a, of national parks, which we claim we created here, was to make it for the people, not just for one segment of the people. And that's why uh, you know, increasing the entrance fees to national parks is a, is, a, is a bad idea because it begins to, again, just sort of reinforce that separation uh, or that this is, this is too expensive. So I think that the conservation community that has traditionally fought for you know, the protection of national parks, uh, the wilderness societies, the Sierra Clubs, needs to get out of their, their box and think about environmental justice and social justice and ecosystem services and urban parks um, in, uh, in the, the relationship to the, a much larger conservation movement. It's time to get out of the silos and stop fighting amongst themselves over little pieces of crumbs left on the table, on the appropriations table, and start working together across communities towards these larger goals. Okay. <laughs> I see a lot of support for that. Let me ask you a tougher one. <laughs> you solved that one. So Ed, let me give you this one. So you have worked all over the world. You've worked extensively in Africa and rainforests and other, other um, ecosystems. I mean, I work with a lot of municipalities, and I can't even get one municipality to agree on recycling with the next municipality yeah. over. Yeah. So how do we, looking at the global nature of what the Half Earth Project would require, get the governance structures around the world to agree on mapping, protecting, all the things that you talked about. I'm going to turn, you know, uh, pass over to my colleague again, but before I do, I want to mention um, that uh, because, you know, this becomes heavily a political and human governmental complexity problem. Um, but I did, I, I'd like to just mention why, uh, and, or give an answer, why half Earth? Okay. Um, if we get half Earth set aside, we will lower the extinction rate to pre-human levels for about 85% of all of the existing species. Now, how do we know that? That comes from the theory of island biogeography, which was uh, developed here at Harvard and by, at Princeton. By him. Well, I didn't, <laughs> well, I didn't want to dilute it by uh, it. <laughs> but it has been uh, developed further, and it's been tested in the field and so on. Why don't you explain? Uh, the relationship between area uh, in which uh, natural environments can exist and the number of species that can uh, persist there is it's still very abstract, but it's a pro at least approximately correct. One half, 85% right away. One half the sea, one half the land. 
Now, can we do, can we make one half? Well, among the many things that uh, can help uh, make it are uh, urban, well, I am now talking about it. Anyway, well, the, uh, the are uh, urban uh, environmental or natural history projects, parks, uh, the kind of uh, enterprise that Chicago created, mm -hmm. for example, in its Chicago wilderness, taking every available unused bits of land from vacant lots to riverine, uh, unused uh, pieces of land and so on, mapping them, trying to get them preserved as best as possible, studying, doing uh, taxonomic uh, inventories of them as much as possible, and then getting young people into them for field trips to aid in the mapping process. Uh, this sort of thing, I think, could mean uh, drawing uh, a lot of benefit right from the hearts of the cities. Do you think that when you think about actually doing this, implementing this, one of the impediments that, that comes up and that John talks about in his book is the fragmentation across all of the groups that are could be supportive, health groups, religious groups, environmental groups, historical protection groups, scientists, uh, all different kinds of groups with their own particular way of approaching things, which are very, very fragmented landscape. How can we, and John, you, you, you have a whole chapter on this in your book, you know, how, how can we address this kind of fragmentation around all of the, the parties that would need to come together to, to implement and realize a, a vision like, like Half Earth? You're looking at me. Mm. No, well, I'm, I'm actually yeah, looking at, at John yeah. on yeah. this one, yeah. Um, well, you know, there's, there's nothing like a crisis uh, to, uh, to galvanize <clears throat> public support, and we're certainly seeing the manifestation of that uh, across the nation right now uh, with uh, marches for science and for women and for gun control and, uh, and, and a number of other, uh, immigration as well. And the opportunity is really here for coalitions to be built uh, that can really help lead societal change. Um, and where, where you find the opportunity to find some common ground, all too often we get together and we talk about our differences. Um, and that almost always leads to going back into your silo. Um, there are good examples uh, around the country. We cite a few of them. Uh, in the book around the Chesapeake Bay, uh, in the, the Blackfoot Challenge, which is sort of North uh, Glacier National Park, Canadian border, front range of the Rockies, where for about 25 years, um, ranchers, uh, farmers, uh, the timber industry, uh, fishermen, hunters, um, wildlife biologists, uh, agency people have been working together uh, to create essentially a sustainable ecosystem in the Northern Rockies. And it's been quite successful. Uh, and basically they get together in a dive bar called Trixie's and drink beer and talk about how to accomplish small goals and move forward uh, together. And I think that um, the opportunity is to learn from these lessons, not only domestically but internationally, because uh, I like to say that the U.S. created the National Park idea when it went around the world and came back, it was different. And, and they've learned in other places around the world to incorporate indigenous people in a much more coherent way than we've ever done here in the United States, or to how to understand larger landscapes, or how to do recovery uh, and restoration uh, of large landscapes as well in other parts of the world. So I think that, to me, we're in this sort of perfect moment in time where, we, where there is clearly an assault uh, on the environment from many, many factors, not just this sort of current administration, but even more broadly than that. It's an assault on science. Um, and the opportunity is to, to bridge what have been former uh, separations amongst the environmental justice, the social justice, classic environmental, um, the public health, um, municipalities, and the 
hunting and fishing crowd, all of these have some crossover interests. Um, and if we can just take a moment, take some time, focus on those, and look in the long term, uh, we can make some extraordinary strides towards uh, the future conservation. Mm. Uh, from your perspective, having watched science and environmental policy for many, many years, is what we're seeing right now in this administration, is, is this, is this unprecedented or have you have we been here before well I you you we may have been um, uh, about here during the presidency of uh, President Buchanan <laughs> 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 I mean in terms of sophistication and sincere <laughs> uh, hopes of saving uh, the environment and the economy um, anyway but what I wanted to do if I may is to go on and just ask my colleague here uh, about two things that have impressed me a lot within the park system and policy. Uh, one is the preserve, and you know I'm from Alabama. You can't tell that from the way I talk. <laughs> <I know. laughs> but at any rate, when you go down there, uh, they want to know, if you start talking about a park anywhere, they want to know, is this going to interfere with my hunting, my fishing? Right. Well, right. Uh, so uh, the preserve, which uh, can be added on to a portion of the park, mm -hmm. does allow that and may even encourage it. Isn't that correct? That's correct, right. Okay, well, right. That, that's, that's a marvelous thing. Certainly in Alaska, yeah. the 13 million acres, uh, four and a half of that is a preserve. Uh, yeah. which is open to sport hunting. Well, that goes a long way, I think, to giving a wedge hmm. in the support hmm. of park and other forms of, of reserved land. Uh, the other thing you don't hear much about, but I'm very impressed by the idea, is the uh, National Natural Landmark System. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, as I understand there are 500 of Correct. these specially designated uh, places of great historical or natural environment uh, significance. There are n national n natural landmarks and there are natural or national historic landmarks too. So they are places of, on the natural side of high biological diversity, uh, unique ecosystems. Uh, they can be privately owned. M many of them are privately owned uh, and uh, or on other public lands. Um, and it is a designation that uh, it held, is held by the Secretary of the Interior. It doesn't have to go to the President. Um, and um, it comes from citizen um, recommendations. Um, so uh, citizens rise up and ask for these places to be set aside. And, um, and that could be a key component uh, to a much larger conservation network across a, a landscape. Uh, right, and I've also become acquainted with um uh, the um, Corridor Conservation Act before mm -hmm. Congress, which is, uh, I believe, Representative Geyer, mm -hmm. uh, Beyer, any rate, of the Virginia. And um, this is to uh, convert whatever federal lands fit geographically to wildlife corridors. Right. I, thought that was, uh, I thought that was a brilliant idea. Is, is that got a chance of passing, do you think? I think it does, and it, you know, it's one of the uh, communities that's really behind it a lot is the hunting community um, that are yeah. um, supportive. And again, it's one of those sort of strange coalitions, but it is an opportunity for us to look at the landscape scale and say, you know, where are these migratory corridors? Uh, you know, one of the professors at Berkeley that I work with is looking at migratory corridors in the Yellowstone ecosystem. And the most famous one that you've probably all heard about is the pathway of the pronghorn, uh, which really was a route from Grand Teton over into the Wind River Range in Wyoming. And there were barriers to the pronghorn's uh, seasonal migration, including fencing and highways. And, and, um, and over time, by working with ever, all of those landowners, they now, the, the pronghorn, have a capability of moving from their summer and winter ranges. And I think that, and you know, if you do it for one species like that, there are many species below that that, as you well know, that uh, benefit from that sort of umbrella approach. And I think as we begin to look at these corridors, figure out how to protect them, how to get them into some sort of, and it doesn't mean they have to be in federal ownership. 
They can be conservation easements, there can be land trusts, there's all different uh, routes to that, to that end. You know, we're going to we're going to take a, a couple of questions now. Yeah. So just just before we pivot to uh, questions from the audience, I just wanted to ask each of you, what should young people be doing now? What, John? You have a, a, a manifesto for transferring the torch to the next generation. You mentioned mapping. What should young people be doing now, today? What's the most important thing? What's the path forward? Run for office. <laughs> uh, I would say for those, uh, and that might include a majority of the crowd of students here um, who are considering a career still, have some flexibility, uh, keep in mind the enormous opportunities uh, for good public service and their own careers of one, in science, the biology of biodiversity, ecosystems, and other complex environmental problems which we haven't sufficiently uh, addressed in order to save the living part of the environment. And then, in addition, uh, to um, consider careers in which the protection of the natural environment uh, is a key, whether it's law, whether it's business management, uh, is a key ethical <coughs> and practical element. Okay. Yeah, I would you add. Want to add something? Yeah, I'll just say that, you know, a, a life in conservation uh, can be extraordinarily frustrating and rewarding at the same time. Uh, you know, Leopold said that the, uh, to be a biologist is to walk in the world of wounds. Um, but at the same time, you want to, uh, to help fix that. And, um, and, and I, I would suggest that don't necessarily think of conservation as one particular career track, that you have to go into an NGO or you have to go in the, into public service, that the business community uh, needs conservationists. Uh, the municipal planning districts need conservationists. The architecture and landscape architecture fields need conservationists. Um, so there are many, many, the earth needs a good lawyer, so we have need a lot of those. Um, so think about conservation as a core value um, and, um, and then bring it uh, to whatever career path that you may pursue uh, and then influence that sector uh, in, in powerful ways um, as, as the millennial generation rises and takes over uh, all of the institutions that we currently have and creates new ones as well. So uh, there's great, great opportunity and great power. Thank you. So I think we're gonna take some questions from the audience <coughs> now. Uh, the Kennedy School rules here for the forum are that all questions must questioners must identify themselves. You can ask one brief question per person, and all questions have to an end with a question mark. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, thank you. We have four, uh, three, four microphones, four microphones here, so why don't we start here? Okay, uh, I'm Barbara Passero from uh, an organization called Meadowscaping for Biodiversity, and we're working on pro projects that will work here in, right in your own backyard. So I was going to ask about Doug. I, anyway, I wanted to say it's so wonderful to see you both. Oh my God, I feel so honored just to after reading everything and following both your life and everything. I'm so excited. But um, so Douglas Tallamy is talks about bringing nature home, and that's what we're trying to do. And is that are you working on any of that of doing that in America? And and. And uh, that's what we're trying to do is a little, little part of our country, or our whole country if we get there. So is that a question? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Here's a question, question. Mark. Yeah. Question. Sure, that's what we call that gardening. Yes. And uh, landscape planning. And I'll tell you what would be of immense value immediately if it could be done, is start getting rid of exotic ornamental plants. Shrubs, arborescent vegetation, anything. Get rid of them. Don't put them out. Put out the equally beautiful 
native arborescent plantation, the shrubs and so on, uh, and flowers. Because one of the deadliest things that we have been doing to a large part of the fauna, including the bird fauna, for example, is planting uh, trees or, uh, you know, plants, ornamentals, uh, chosen for the way we think they look uh, and not their origin or their meaning or significance for the environment. Uh, the result of this is that insects that normally would feed in abundance around, you know, around gar in gardens, in, in woodland around and so on, um, <clears throat> find, particularly at the critical moments, uh, times of the, of the year when they're raising young, as for example, the black chickadee, the, the black-capped chickadee, um, cannot find insect food because the insects cannot feed on some, a large percentage of these types of imported plants. So to go to native flora and make an interesting thing out of it as well, I would think if I was starting a garden now myself uh, with shrubs, trees, and also flowering plants, uh, I would love to be able to plant endangered species or very interesting species and be able to share with others the stories of them and so on. So that's the, one of the major ways that we can help wildlife of all sizes in this country. I agree with him. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Ben Bolcher, and uh, my, my question is, first of all, I think Ken Burns correctly said that the U.S. Park Service is probably America's best idea, so I just wanted to thank you for, for that. Yeah, it is. Um, my question is for Professor Wilson. Um, if we think about really holistic and thoughtful conservation, um, the staggering population growth in the world seems to be somewhat problematic in terms of conservation. Um, and experiments with addressing population growth have been problematic. China's experimentation uh, with population limitation has had a number of issues. So is there a need to decrease our skyrocketing billions of people growth? And if there is a need, what are some realistic options that we can do it in a sensible way? Uh, should we lessen population growth and how to do it. Is that the question? Sure. Okay. Uh, yes, and um, by um, continuing uh, full out improving the economic and health and general living standards of the populations of the United States and every other country in turn. In other words, what we want to see happen to the world because when uh, people get healthier, but especially dramatically, it's been shown that when women get any kind of economic independence, it can be as little as a little penny arcade on the side of a street somewhere in one of these uh, developing countries, cities, the birth rate plummets because Women, it turns out, I'm not an expert on them, but as it turns out, uh, prefer a small number of quality children over playing, uh, gambling with a number uh, that uh, their husbands would like to see. Okay, thank you. All right, so up, up there on the right. Hi, my name's Louis Gowden. I'm a student. Uh, my question is fairly short, which might be a bit unusual in the forum, but um, if you both could pick uh, one thing, uh, one policy, a national level policy that you could implement that you think would have the greatest single impact to promote biodiversity, to promote conservation, what would it be? All right, I'll really take a short. shot, uh, and I'll, um, I would, fully fund the Land and Water Conservation Fund at, at its uh, appropriation level, which is 900 million. And I would use the fund 
to infill uh, large landscapes to create connectivity across uh, the United States. And it funded year after year after year after year. Uh, the revenue stream comes from outer continental shelf oil leasing. The money goes into the federal treasury and then is reappropriated. It's only been fully appropriated one time in its history. Um, and uh, it was a goal of ours in the Obama administration to fully fund it. Uh, we never achieved that. Uh, but if there was a, a source of funds that we could begin to create these large uh, protected areas and connect them across the landscape, then that could have long-term uh, positive impact for biodiversity. Okay. Uh, Actually, Ed gets his oh, chance. Uh, well, I hear it. I, yeah. I would think that somehow, and I don't have a very clear idea of just how you will achieve it, uh, but we've got to uh, vote in the power leaders at every level uh, who would regard uh, the natural health of this country and other countries that uh, the United States chooses to help. It's natural, and you know, the value of its natural environment, the envi environment uh, that takes care of itself and is healthy, uh, that that is as important a, um, a quality uh, and, and the goal from it uh, as any other political, more political, human-centered uh, uh, view, uh, viewpoint and, and program uh, as, as we have. And start making this a part of our political, ideological, and philosophical dialogue. And I'm talking to you, New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Lyle Selixson. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, and I have a question for Mr. Drivis, uh, going back to c conservation in our current political climate. Uh, especially in light of recent action by the Trump administration concerning Bears Ears and um, Grand Circus Escalante National Monuments, uh, what do you see as the future of the Antiquities Act and its role in conservation in America going forward? Okay. Um, well, just a quick background education on the Antiquities Act. The Antiquities Act is a uh, U.S. law that grants the President of the United States unilaterally uh, to set aside uh, objects, quote unquote objects, uh, of scientific or historical uh, interest uh, a as a national monument. Um, and it has been uh, utilized since Teddy Roosevelt to establish places like the Grand Canyon, uh, Devil's Post Pile, a number, a number of places, Muir Woods. Um, and um, it is controversial uh, in that the, um, the Congress doesn't get a say uh, in the process. It's, a, it's an executive power. Um, and um, pretty much every modern president since Teddy has used it, just a very, very few, Ronald Reagan, uh, George H.W. Uh, Bush did not use it, uh, but uh, George W. Bush did use it, Bill Clinton, and then uh, uh, President Obama certainly used it uh, quite extensively, including establishing uh, the Bears Ears National Monument in Utah, which was, uh, if I can go just for a second, in incredibly important because the, the assertion for the protection of this area came from uh, an intertribal coalition, uh, that this is their homeland, they, this site has 100,000 archaeological sites um, still being actively used by the five tribes uh, in, the, in the tribal coalition. And it was our assertion, our attempt in this administration to give them management authority uh, as far as we could go legally uh, to the tribes uh, over these lands. Uh, President Trump has, has unwound that, uh, reducing it from over a million acres down to about 200,000 acres. Um, significantly taken away about 80%. Uh, that is in legal challenge uh, right now, um, whether or not the, um, the president actually has the authority to sort of de-designate that whether or not the law is a one-way law rather than a two-way law. And that will be tested uh, in the courts. During, in this interim, of course, I worry that uh, there will be 
uh, leasing for oil and gas and uranium and other things will happen on these lands in, in the meantime uh, that will be very difficult to, to repair over, over the... But the, the question you had is the, that the Antiquities Act has had a, a bullseye painted on it for a long time uh, from the Republican-led Congress. Uh, they would like to uh, um, restrict the president's authority. Um, and I think that uh, given the chance, uh, they will absolutely attempt it. Um, whether or not you know, a sitting president would give away that authority uh, is an open question. Um, you know, because it is a very, very powerful law that only presidents can wield. And, um, uh, but who knows uh, at this point uh, you know, where it will wind up. But I, I do worry about it because it has been an extraordinarily important tool at times. Uh, Jimmy Carter uh, set aside uh, almost 80 million acres in Alaska with a stroke of a pen. Uh, and um, and those, today those lands are still uh, protected. Right. Laura. Hi, I'm Hi. Laura. Um, I'm a graduate student here at the Kennedy School. Um, so I think it's easy enough, or maybe not easy enough, to set aside lands for protection that aren't being used. But how do you have a conversation with lands that are currently the sole source of income and provide a, li a livelihood for the farmers or fishermen or loggers? And how do you kind of win that debate when you're talking about people's lives? and you know, their, their source, sole source of income in the conservation debate. He could answer that, but I'll take a shot at that. Uh, that's why I was bringing up earlier uh, the concept of preserves mm -hmm. and of landmarks. Uh, we, uh, we've worried a lot about that in discussing the Half-Earth Project. And there is no reason uh, for having, in addition to reserves that may be already in place, wilderness areas that may already be recognized, uh, there is also uh, certainly a place where, first of all, indigenous people are encouraged yeah. to continue their lives there. But it can be as well uh, that uh, short of uh, major agriculture, logging and mining, uh, areas that are designated or cl clearly need to be designated for the purposes uh, that we've been speaking to, uh, that uh, people could in areas that are already in economic usage of this sort continue. It's just that uh, those areas and we don't, uh, we can't and figure it out yet just how many there might be, what percentage of the half Earth that would include. Uh, but these areas then uh, could be treated in the same manner as the uh, natural landmarks. Designated as very important with uh, all of the encouragement that can be summoned to keep them the way they are, uh, even though people are, uh, are already there, other than indigenous people. Uh, I think this worked out, for, for example, in the case of the Great Smoky Mountain National Park and the, uh, the Appalachian people who are in the various coves and parts of the, um, of the park. Uh, they were simply uh, told to Evicted. Uh, stay there and, and, and enjoy the lives they'd uh, had enjoyed for generations. It, it, it'll work, particularly if you have a, um, an ethical, uh, a moral argument behind putting the emphasis on biodiversity, more areas thus designated. I, I think that the key to it, in my experience, and I've worked in the bush of Alaska and in the arid west uh, in my career, is sitting down with those individuals before any type of plan is done and talking about them, what, where their values are, what is it that they uh, uh, want uh, from these lands, and what are they taking now, what are they, uh, how are their lives being enhanced by the presence of these lands, and then try to accommodate that uh, within whatever construct that we're creating. And I think there, 
There are new models of parks out there. There are preserves, there are green line parks, there are heritage areas, uh, there are privately owned parks, there are, there are parks that are made up of a mixture of different kinds of lands, some of them available for still um, you know, active use, uh, whether it's ATVs, all-terrain vehicles, or, or hunting, or fishing, or, uh, and the like. And I think that we need to be open to these kinds of ideas in order to garner the kind of public uh, support uh, for them to persist. I mean, they are, we need to keep in mind, these things are political constructs, right? And they can be taken away. Uh, and so, um, what I have found, though, is that if you go in with that kind of approach, with a listening approach, then create it, over time, support uh, grows and builds. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe not at the sort of political uh, edges of the fringes, but at the, at the community level, it can be built over time. Okay, we have time just for a couple <coughs> more quick questions. Okay, gentleman over there, we'll take the first person there, um, first person at that microphone, the first person at this microphone. Okay, so this one is uh, mainly to uh, Director Jarvis, but also to Professor Wilson. So with a country where more than 80% of the population lives in cities, how do you think we connect people and sort of continue to connect people to the American tradition of wilderness uh, and kind of keep that relevant <clears throat> in the same way that it was to John Muir and kind of all the traditional conservationists the past? Um, well, a friend of mine once said her idea of a wilderness experience was Nordstrom's with only $25. Um, uh, so um, <clears throat> I think that, um, you know, as much as I love incredibly wild places, uh, I think that we need to recognize that <clears throat> the experience of the outdoors is on a, on a range, on a spectrum. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, you can have an extraordinary outdoor experience in Central Park and be right in the heart of New York City. Uh, and that may be enough uh, for a lot of people. They don't necessarily need uh, to, you know, to, to be in the bush of Alaska. We need their support that the bush of Alaska is protected. Uh, and Alaska would never have been protected without the people of New York City or uh, many, many urban. If it had been left up to just the people that live in Alaska, we would never have gotten those parks uh, created. So I think that we need to provide nature near home, uh, is, to me, is the key. And, that, and there needs to be a, sort of a ladder of opportunity uh, for individuals to experience nature. That particularly, that's why we created with President Obama the Every Kid in a Park Pass, uh, targeting fourth graders and that sort of age. And then we had our conservation corps, which were focused on teenagers, uh, and then youth course, you know, focused on more in the 20s. And so this is an opportunity to build that relationship and comfort and skill level to be able to go into, into wild places as well. And I think over time that can have, uh, you know, build an advocacy for wilderness. Shall we, um, okay. okay. We're, we're, I'm getting signal that we are desperately running out of time here. So I'm gonna move to next question. Um, gentleman over there. Thank you. Uh, Kadeem Gilbert, uh, graduate student in the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology, Nomi Pierce's lab. Uh, my, my question is uh, for Professor Wilson. Uh, while I um, am in full support for your plea for uh, more taxonomy, I'm wondering whether, given the potential for limited resources or manpower, whether there are uh, priority taxa, in your opinion, how we would um, prioritize uh, which taxa we focus on. Uh, did you just say which taxa to prioritize to For, for taxonomic work, yes. Uh, well, um, I'll give you the same answer uh, when, uh, that I give if I'm asked, and thank you for identifying our apartment. Right. Okay. That's the apartment I helped build. Um, and at any rate, um, the, uh, I give you the answer that I give when I'm asked how to prioritize which species to save. Mm. And uh, I'll say the same thing on terms of uh, which groups of organisms to study. And that is, to them all. <laughs> all. 
Uh, in fact, if <clears> I were uh, an ambitious young guy like you, I, I don't know whether you have interest in systematics, but if uh, I were looking around now for uh, a subject that in which I could be a pioneer, I would go for the groups that have not been prioritized and become mm. the world authority on that group as a first step in my career. It won't be ants, but it can be. <laughs> <laughs> That's taken. But it, it can be tardigrades, yeah. it can be nematodes, and you can go on down the list and use a dart on a cork board <laughs> and be a major success in your career in biology. Thank yeah. you, sir. <laughs> it's great. All right, well, one final question. Um, I guess that's the final question. I want to thank you all for being here. My name is Andy. I'm a master's student studying bioinformatics at Harvard Extension School. And my question is, when we think of conservation, frequently we think about it in terms of extinction. But when we're thinking about extant species, are there risk mitigation strategies for identifying populations that are um, in danger of becoming genetically bottlenecked? And if they're already genetically bottlenecked, what kind of strategies exist to address that? Would you repeat that? Because yeah. I, um, yeah, I or you get her to repeat for me for. Oh, Go ahead, do it again. Yeah. I, I, uh, <laughs> um, how can we? identify species or populations that are at risk for becoming genetically bottlenecked, or if they're already genetically bottlenecked, what strategies exist to address their conservation? Genetic bottlenecks. Well, that's the core of, uh, part of the core of conservation biology. Uh, we have a whole series of techniques based upon foundation of population biology on uh, assessing uh, the elements of growth or stability of population, and these can be ones that are super abundant, all the way down to ones that are critically endangered, and make a prediction as to what will be happening to that population in, say, the near future, or may, maybe ultimately, and make decisions, particularly with reference to those that are on the IUCN red list, uh, which ones, I mean, uh, how to handle each species in turn, whether it needs a broader area to spread in, whether we need to actually take uh, some action in eliminating an invasive weed, uh, whether or not we should have more controls uh, over uh, alien species of insects that have come in. And, uh, you know, this is, the, this is a whole field of endeavor we haven't, we scarcely mentioned here tonight. But since I'm in the business, I think of myself in the business of career counseling. Uh, this is certainly a field, one of the field, like systematics uh, and cataloging or in, of the biodiversity of the, discovering the biodiversity of the world. This is a great subject to go into, both in discoveries you would make in the biology, in the technology to be applied to building new methods of estimation and so on, or directly in the more policy-oriented uh, domains of uh, putting this across to a larger public. Well, we have already uh, gone over my, my um, 20 minutes over the time that I was given, so I want to thank Professor Wilson and John Jarvis Two extraordinary guests. I'll give them a big hand. Thank you so much for everything you do. Okay. Thank you.